Walter, as always, thank you very much for having me here again. And everyone, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak to you today about this very exciting topic. Um, and I am very grateful to be here in this beautiful Captiva Island, uh, beautiful weather, and hope everybody enjoys themselves after all this coursework. Um, as Dr. Walter mentioned, uh, I do have an integrative rehab medicine clinic, and we really focus a lot on regenerative medicine. Uh, my, my goal with my patients is to treat their pain, but even more so to help them heal their injuries and restore function. So I'm always out there looking for the newest and the best ways to stimulate uh, a healing response, to stimulate uh, a, an approach to help my patients improve their function. And stem cells happens to be one of them. So we'll talk about it. Uh, let's see if I've got to figure this thing out right here. There we go. I do not have any financial relationships to disclose. Bobby, am I supposed to aim this to something? Okay, very good. Um, so my objectives, we're gonna talk about what stem cells are uh, and what they're not as well. The sources of stem cells, in, especially in musculoskeletal medicine, uh, what are the regulations? This is not a free-for-all. There is quite a bit of regulations on how do we use stem cells and when to use and what stem cells we can use. We're going to talk a little bit about how to perform a stem cell procedure. Uh, this is not a course on, that's going to teach you how to do it, but just a little, little, little sneak peek. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the conditions that are being treated, some of the brief literature review, and also you know, how to integrate a whole medical approach and how to integrate stem cells into the practice. So as Dr. Fleschner said, one of my loves and one of my passions is regenerative medicine, and that's what we really offer in our, in our practice, amongst other things, amongst physical medicine. Uh, but I started doing regenerative medicine, I would say about 12, 12, maybe 13 years ago, and it started with prolotherapy. Now, have any, anybody here has heard of prolotherapy in the past? Well, Walter has. And it's an older technique where you, but still used very, very commonly, where you inject dextrose to stimulate a healing response uh, of ligaments and other tissues. Then, then, I, then the regenerative medicine doctors got a little, bit, a little bit more exciting, and they started injecting other things like platelet-rich plasma, um, and now we're also injecting stem cells. And there's other modalities such as lasers, and other modalities that basically are all part of regenerative medicine, and regenerative medicine basically is used to help patients heal from injuries, from any other traumatic events that need a stimulation of, uh, a little bit of stimulus to heal a little bit better. So let's talk about the stem cells. What are stem cells? Um, there's a lot of misconceptions what stem cells are and how they function. So we're gonna try to, um, uh, I guess, clarify that a little bit more. And at least with our current knowledge, this is what we think. It may change in a few years, but this is our current knowledge. So stem cells are undifferentiated cells. They're basically hanging out in your body and they're ready to repair and replace. Uh, they have the potential to turn into different types of cells. They can differentiate into uh, cartilage-forming cells, bone-forming cells, muscle-forming cells. They're basically pluripotent. They can become anything they need. And more importantly, especially in musculoskeletal medicine, they orchestrate a whole immune response. Uh, they actually help repair and replace and regenerate, probably through different mechanisms that most people think, uh, but they are very much involved. And they're found everywhere in our body. They're not just found in the bone marrow. They're found in the fat tissue. They're found in muscles. They're found in blood vessels, brain. Anywhere you can think of, there are specific stem cells there. And there's different types of stem cells. There are embryonic. Uh, there's the perinatal, which are... Uh, the birth tissues, and adult stem cells. And we're going to focus more on adult stem cells. So, as I mentioned earlier, stem cells have a potential to differentiate. Uh, they can become mesenchymal stem cells, uh, as you can see on the left, and those can become more specific for bone regeneration, for cartilage, for muscles, other tissue. And there's other types of stem cells, hemopoietic, where they create more of the blood, blood, blood line of cells and some neural cells. So we're gonna focus more on the mesenchymal stem cells. And it used to be thought that 
that this is, this is what happens in, in, in medicine, where we take some of these stem cells from whatever source we think, and we take them and we inject them into a knee or a tendon, and they become these wonderful cartilage cells or whatever other cells, and they repair. But that is not the case. That is not what actually happens in vivo. Uh, so that, that is a, an old thought, and now that has been actually uh, updated. Uh, Dr. Kaplan is one of the pioneers in stem cell research. He's the person who actually coined MSC, mesenchymal stem cells, and I'm sure most of you have heard the term mesenchymal stem cells. And more recently, in the last couple of years, he started promoting that we actually change the name. We don't call them mesenchymal stem cells anymore. We call them medicinal signaling cells. These are little cells that are like little factories of signals, and that's going to be what we're going to talk about as far as the mechanism of action. They're the master orchestrators of healing and regeneration. So in vitro, we can take the stem cells and we can differentiate them into anything we want. So we can take some bone marrow stem cells, some, some of them, these mesenchymal stem cells, and give them some stimulus, some factors, and they can differentiate into you know, bone cells or car cartridge, cartilage cells or anything else. But that's not necessarily what happens in, in vivo. When, when we inject it inside our patients, these cells don't become their new muscle cells or their new cartilage cells. What actually happens, they become these master orchestrators, they become these, these uh, pharmacies. Basically these stem cells, these mesenchymal stem cells, get to that injury area and they sense the environment. They're, they're feeling out what needs to happen. Do we need, is, this, is there too much inflammation or is there not enough inflammation? Is there maybe some kind of bacterial infection going on? And they have a very good developed sensing mechanism and then they, they replicate themselves, they, they form a stronger army, and they secrete all these growth factors. And what they do, they can actually stimulate some of these um, niche cells, which are the resident stem cells that are in those tissues, to then become those car, you know, cartilage cells or those muscle cells or other cells. Themselves, they actually don't do that. Um, so stem cells for musculoskeletal use are most often uh, the, basically taken from these parasite, uh, pericytes, not parasites, but pericytes. And basically they're little cells that are on the blood vessels. And when we take the bone marrow or fat or whatever other product, we take them and shake them off those blood vessels, and then they become these mesenchymal stem cells or medicinal signaling cells, as Dr. Kaplan said. And then they get a little activated by the area they, where they are, and they start releasing all these growth factors. They're, they're like these little pharmacies, and they release trophic growth factors, things that help us you know, for anti-scarring, anti-optotic, angiogenic, so they stimulate growth of blood vessels. Uh, they stimulate uh, the other cells to actually do more work. They're also very immunomodulatory, and that's why there's some pretty good research coming out on rheumatoid arthritis and other rheumatological diseases because these cells, again, are sensing the environment and they're modulating the local immune system. And they're also very antimicrobial. That's why we see that a lot of these stem cell procedures, there's typically very little uh, complications, especially um, infectious complications, because these cells themselves, they are very antimicrobial. So um, I'm assuming many of you have heard of platelet-rich plasma in the past. Right, where we take these platelets and we inject them and these platelets burst and they release all these growth factors and that usually happens uh, for about a week or so. Well, stem cells are kind of like that, but much, much long, longer term. They basically release a lot of the same growth factors, but instead of just staying there for about a week, they stay there for months or months or even sometimes years. They just hang out in that area and they're constantly secreting all these wonderful growth factors. And there's a lot of research. Currently, on, on the clinicaltrials.gov, there is 1,300 clinical trials that are listed on just mesenchymal stem cells. And every year, this, is, this, goes, this number goes up and up and up. So where do we get these stem cells? Well, we have the autologous form, where we get it from ourselves, and then there's from others, the allogenic. 
So most of the autologous form for um, musculoskeletal medicine comes from either bone marrow, fat, and then there's some new research now trying to get them from blood and other less invasive uh, procedures. Then you have the uh, allogenic stem cells, which are the stem cells from others and other, other people. And that's where you get the umbilical cord blood and then amionic fluid. And there's some pretty good research that came out recently uh, from Cornell University showing that a lot of these products that are out there that are being injected in multiple clinics and chiropractic clinics, that these actually do not have any live cells. So these amionic fluid products and these blood, cord blood products that people are paying you know, $10,000 for, most of these products don't actually have any live cells. They might have some growth factors, but it's not, it's not real. It's, and actually a lot of these, these clinics that are claiming to be injecting stem cells, uh, the FDA and other organizations are starting to crack down on them. That, that, that is not what they're doing. It's, it's misinformation. So again, most, most of the clinics that are doing stem cell work for musculoskeletal use either bone marrow and fat, and that seems to be where most of the research is as well. But there is quite a bit of regulations on how we can use these. Um, we can use bone marrow or fat, but we can only minimally manipulate them. What, what that means, we cannot produce a drug out of them. So if you look at this slide over here, right on the left side, if we take some bone marrow stem cells and on the same day maybe concentrate them and inject them into the patient, we are not creating a drug. We are just transferring tissue. And as long as we inject them into an area that's homologous, meaning it's similar tissue to simil similar um, origin of tissue to similar tissue where we're injecting, we're doing okay. We're not crossing any boundaries. But then if you go to the next part of that slide, if we take those stem cells and we put them in a petri dish and we grow them and multiply them and then we inject them, then we are drug makers and that needs FDA approval and that is no longer allowed in this country. Uh, there's other places in other countries uh, you can go somewhere in Central and South America where you can get um, cultured cells, stem cells. But in, uh, currently in the United States, you cannot do that because there is more than minimal manipulation and you would need an FDA approval for that. Same thing with fat. Fat has a lot of great amount of st stem cells. Fat is very vascular. And as I told you earlier, a lot of these stem cells come from these pericytes, which are these perivascular cells. And you can get those cells, well, you, we could, we could no longer can, um, and use them as stem cells. So currently, if you take the fat and you concentrate it, maybe mix it up a little bit and inject it, you're doing okay. You're not making a drug. Uh, you don't need any FDA approval. You can still inject them, and it's just tissue transfer. Um, and we do that quite often, but what used to be more common was to take the fat and digest it with certain enzymes to break down some of those fat particles to retrieve a lot of those stem cells. Um, and that's called vascular, stromovascular fraction. And that is no longer allowed because then again, you are a drug maker and you need FDA approval. So SVF is not something that we're doing anymore. And then again, if you put them in a Petri dish and culture them, you are not allowed to do that. So most common stem cells used for MSK medicine, as I mentioned earlier, is bone marrow stem cells. Um, we aspirate them and then you can concentrate them. And what it is, it's, it's a soup of cells. So when you get this bone marrow aspirate, you get a ton of different types of cells. There are some mesenchymal stem cells, there are some red blood cells, there are some white blood cells, there's a lot of platelets, and a lot of growth factors as well. So you know, where, where do we get these and how, and how do we perform this? Um, bone marrow harvesting has it's been done for years and years and I think we're getting better and better to understand where to get them and how to get them to get the best yield possible. It used to be that a lot of these doctors would get them from either the tibia or other bones and it was through multiple studies it was shown that actually the best place to get the most amount of stem cells happens to be the posterior iliac crest, the PSIS. It's very accessible, it's very safe, it is full of mesenchymal cells, stem cells, and you can get a whole lot of stem cells um, compared to other tissues. Um, and you know, they, they've studied ASIS and PSIS, and again, PSIS always seems to be the one that wins. And we'll see some of the other studies that we'll look at where using stem cells from other tissues and 
then may have uh, influenced their results as well. So now we know where to get them from. Now how do we get them and what to use? Um, it is pretty important to understand that there are certain things to not to do when you're doing stem cell injections. Stem cells are, tend to die when they're exposed to lidocaine. So when we are numbing up the area to draw the stem cells, we can put a lot of lidocaine around, but we don't want to put it inside the bone marrow or anywhere else because that will kill the stem cells. We don't want to put the lidocaine into the area where we are injecting either because that will, that will kill the stem cells and then you'll just be giving patients dead cells. Um, it is also very important that you tell the patients that this is not the most comfortable procedure and you take all the, all the measures to make sure that patients are not hurting. So in our clinic, we give patients oxycodone beforehand, maybe some Xanax, sometimes we use nitrous, that helps, tends to help. We give them an epidural, a uh, caudal epidural, uh, that seems to numb things up. Uh, and that seems to control things. The most painful component of it is typically, it's not when you drill it in, it's actually when you draw up the bone marrow, or aspirate, there is this negative pressure and that's where patients oh, give, you, give you a little warning that they're not having a good time. Uh, but there's ways to control that and I think we figured it out quite a bit and most, most doctors doing stem cells figured it out. Um, and then there's interesting, it makes a difference what kind of syringes you use. So when you draw up this bone marrow, we, we used to be where we take these 60 ml syringes and just, just slowly draw up and just take our sweet time. We found out that that's not the case, that doesn't give us a very good result. You want to use small little syringes and do a very quick pull because those cells are pericytes. They're, they're right next to these blood vessels and you have to take the force to rip them off. So with a slow 60 ml draw, you get just a lot of blood and maybe some platelets. But you got to really do a quick draw. And I'll show you a video on how to do that. So after you get these stem cells, or this uh, bone marrow aspirate, then there's a question to you concentrate or not. And there's some kits that um, claim that you can get the same amount of stem cells without concentrating. Or mo most, of uh, most of physicians that are doing stem cells tend to concentrate it. And we used to be able to culture them here, but we cannot do that here. You have to go out of this country to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a video. This is a two and a half minute video on how to do this procedure. Again, I'm not teaching you this procedure, just giving you a little quick preview. This is a patient who had a labral tear and some hip arthritis and some muscle tears in her hip, so we did use the stem cells to help her repair that. So we just use an ultrasound to mark that area and identify it. before I start numbing up the area. And then we're going to do some lidocaine to numb up the area where the bone marrow aspirate is going to take place. Just give it a good amount of lidocaine. And the idea is to numb up this whole area so once I'm doing the bone marrow aspiration, the patient doesn't feel anything. So what we're going to do, we're going to use these sterile drapes to create what we call a sterile feel. And that allows us to maintain sterility during this whole procedure. So right now I'm injecting some lidocaine and some dextrose into the epidural. So as I said, to man manage the pain, we just do a caudal epidural with some dextrose and some lidocaine and it really tends to calm down a lot of those sacral nerves so the procedure is not very, very painful so for them. the area is anesthetized and sterile, we're going to go ahead and introduce a trocar into the bone to pull out some of the blood stem cells. And I'm going to just use ultrasound to make sure we're in the right position. So the trocar is what's being used trocar. to draw and up. It. And it does take some pressure. You really have to push into that bone. Um, but patients tolerate that part very well.
So here we are, we're in the bone marrow. And then I'm going to use a 10 ml syringe to aspirate it. You're going to feel a little pull, okay? It's a quick pull, and then you rotate it to try to get it from other places. Two. Perfect. How's that? Not too bad? Mm -hmm. I'm going to introduce it just a little bit deeper. Pull. And before we started using some medications and the epidurals, this used to be the most painful part. When we draw it up, the patient <laughs> would let us know this was uncomfortable. Uh, but as you can see, she's, she's just fine. And, and here's oh, our nurse just uh, filtering some of the bone marrow, getting it ready for processing. Into a 60 ml syringe. We will use that syringe to transfer it to the concentrating device. I'm just going to remove the trocar. And put pressure. Not too bad, right? Not very traumatic. We have aspirated that bone marrow fluid. We will clean up the wound. We will put a pressure dressing, and we're going to go to our lab and process the bone marrow into a concentrate. So now that we get the bone marrow concentrate, you know, how is it injected? So, and what is it injected? And as you see some of the studies that we are going to talk about, very often you mix the bone marrow stem cells with something else. Uh, uh, PRP is commonly used uh, because it is a great medium. So when stem cells used to be cultured, or when, when they, well, I guess not here in America, but when they are still cultured in other places, usually PRP or platelet lysate, where you lyse the platelets, uh, is used as a medium because these stem cells just thrive in it very well. So very often when you're actually injecting stem cells for these musculoskeletal procedures, we're using a combination of stem cells and the PRP. You can also use fat as well. Uh, we can't do a, va a, vas a vascular fraction like we did in the past, but you can use it, and that usually is used as a great little padding, or if you want to fill in space, let's say we're doing very large rotator cuff tears or other things, adding that fat can really help uh, to fill in the, those areas. And then sometimes you use different activators, like either a little bit of thrombin or calcium chloride to form a little clot. Um, it has to be guided. You, you really want to get those stem cells injected into the right place. I know there's some clinics out there saying, hey, I'm going to take these stem cells and just inject it in the vicinity of your ankle, and they're going to just get to that area and heal. That doesn't seem to be necessarily the case. Um, so it is important to use either ultrasound or x-ray. Um, and also, you know, how are you doing it? Are you injecting it? There are some surgical measures that you can also use to implant them. And these cells are sticky. So you want to really get into that area. You want to get onto that cartilage or you want to get into the area and spray them right into that area because they want, you want them to get stuck to the place. Now, it is also very important who is performing this, right? You know, I'm, I'm a board-certified physical medicine doctor. We have Adam here. He's an anesthesiologist who's doing a lot of procedures. You know, the, these procedures need to be done by a properly trained physician. Unfortunately, there's a lot of under-trained people performing this. Um, I, I'm sure you guys heard different chiropractic clinics hiring PAs to, you know, who take maybe a weekend course and then go ahead and perform stem cell procedures. So we got to be very cautious also who's performing them and what is their experience and their training level. Um, and then, you know, we got to control the pain because during the injection it's pretty painful and we can't put any lidocaine into the soup of stem cells where we're going to be putting it. So you have to numb up the area or do a nerve block. Let's say like if we're doing a knee, you can do a nerve block to calm it down quite a bit. And then, you know, give the patients oxycodone afterwards. Because for the first three days, they're not going to like you. They're not, they're not very happy. Um, and usually we have our patients non-weight bearing on that knee or uh, braced and really, really take it easy and go home and relax and take your pain medications because it's not a very pleasant situation. So what are some of the musculoskeletal conditions that are being treated? And there's a lot, and we'll just, we'll just go over a couple of them. Uh, tendons are being treated, joints, uh, ligaments, bone fracture, spine, and not nerves yet, but maybe that's somewhere where we're going to get to. So treating tendon disorders with mesenchymal stem cells. Um, on, in the reviews and meta-analysis, the treatment of, of tendons with MSCs 
tends to improve all clinical outcomes. There's some pretty good evidence nowadays that um, muscular or MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells, uh, do a very good job treating tendons. They decrease pain, they improve functional scores, they improve radiological parameters and arthroscopic findings as well. So rotator cuffs are obviously, we know, very common in our population and pretty much all over the world. It is one of the places where I use um, most of my stem cells is for larger rotator cuffs. It works very well. Um, what happens when you don't treat it? So the natural course of non-treated rotator cuff tear is unfortunately to deteriorate. It gets worse. Every year it can get larger and larger. And unfortunately some of these surgical procedures have a pretty high failure rate. Some studies say up to 70-74% of failure one to two years after surgical uh, intervention. Therapy alone can help with symptoms. There's good evidence that therapy can help with the pain and function, but then it comes back. And if you follow these patients and look at the tear size, it actually still progresses. So, you know, we need a little bit, something a little bit better. And then steroid injections, unfortunately, they're very common. They don't, they will not heal the, in the tear. They can help very much with the pain, uh, but they don't heal. And there are some side effects potentially that can worsen the situation. They can actually weaken the tendon. And some uh, surgical evidence shows that if you do steroid injections and then do surgery, there's a pretty significant increased risk of infections. So we tr typically try to stay away from them if we can. So the evidence is pretty, pretty good. So this is a good randomized tr trial of, again, smaller groups. Um, and as you'll see, a lot of these are still smaller groups. We don't have thousands of patients on some of these other studies, but these are pretty good. Uh, so 24 patients, 12 in each group. One, was, um, to one, one group received a ultrasound-guided injection of bone marrow concentrate plus PRP, as we mentioned, and uh, controlled it, a home exercise program. And these patients were evaluated before three weeks and three months, and they were looking at the pain scale, the SS score, which is their functional score, and then the tear size in the ultrasound. So, as you can see on the left, here is a ultrasound image of a pretty large rotator cuff tear. This is a supraspinatus tear, um, and it's measured with the ultrasound. And then on the image on the right, you can see there's a needle being in, inserted into, that, into a tear under ultrasound guidance. In the middle there, you can see the low concentrating device. So as I mentioned earlier, very often after we get that bone marrow aspirate, we take it to our lab and we concentrate it. And these are devices li like these from multiple different companies that basically help you concentrate that all in a nice sterile fashion. So in this study, the patients that got the bone marrow stem cells did pretty well. You know, at three weeks, uh, everybody got a little bit better, but at three months, their pain improved pretty significantly from you know, an average of six to about two. Their functional score improved significantly as well. And so did the uh, exercise group. As I mentioned, exercise can improve the function of people with rotator cuffs. And their tear size decreased uh, a good amount. They do mention, though, that in, 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 the, in the quote here, it says that there wasn't any significant difference in the tear size compared to the control. And you can see this is at three months. And we find that these, these tears take longer to heal. It really is not just three months. You're looking at them at six months or 12 months, and that's when things really heal. And that's the same, th that's the same scenario for surgical candidates. Patients who get surgery for a rotator cuff if you look at the rotator cuff at three months, it is still not going to be healed. There's still a lot of issues. So I think this study was just a little bit premature to, uh, at, at those three months. And from the same author, they did mention that actually these bone marrow stem cells, they enhance proliferation and migration of tendon-specific stem cells. So as you remember earlier, I, I mentioned within that tissue, there's already some specific stem cells that live in there. So when we inject these mesenchymal stem cells, they actually activate these stem cells, these resident niche cells to do more work of the healing. So this is another study by Dr. Centeno. Uh, Dr. Centeno has done a lot of research on stem cells. He has multiple clinics throughout the country and has done some very good work. Uh, he's the head of Regenix. 
Um, and they did a pretty nice study where they take, took 11 patients in an exercise group, 14 in a stem cell group, and then after six months, the actual exercise group carried over and went into the bone marrow stem cell group. And they did either home exercise or bone marrow stem cells uh, with, with which ultrasound guided injection and home rehab. And what you can see is that they improved in their n numeric pain score significantly and it, they're better at three months, but it keeps them getting better. At six months, it's still better. And 12 months and 24 months, so these patients are healing and healing. And as I mentioned earlier, these, these mesenchymal stem cells, they're hanging out there and the body is, is going through a healing process. So this is not a short-term fix. This is for people that want to do a long-term intervention. And as you can see, their, their, uh, their functional group, group scores improved as well. So, you know, what is my experience? We use stem cells quite a bit for uh, rotator cuff tears. Uh, we usually do it more for the larger tears. Uh, we use it with the PRP. For the smaller tears, we, we get away pretty well with, uh, P, with just platelet-rich plasma. There's also other things that we add to st stabilize the joint. We usually do prolotherapy and other parts to make sure that the whole joint is, is healthy. When you have a rotator cuff, it's not a rotator cuff tear, it's typically not just that is the tissue that's been injured. You really have to look at the whole joint, the whole scapula, and see you know, the stability. There's the glenohumeral head uh, moving up and down. Do you need to stabilize the glenohumeral ligaments? So there's a lot of work, and when you do that, you tend to get the best results. Instead of just putting stem cells into that tear, you really have to treat the whole tissue. And we usually have patients go through physical therapy. We have embrace for our large tears or complete tears that are not retracted. We haven't put in a brace. Uh, they usually wear their brace and it's gradually come down for about four weeks. Um, the other thing is, you know, we have an integrative clinic. We gotta make sure that these patients have the right nutrition. And we also add some other modalities. So definitely a whole, whole person approach to do this. So I'm gonna show you this video right here. Some of you may recognize this person. Patricia. I saw Dr. Sebastian earlier this year when I had left shoulder pain and we diagnosed a large left rotator cuff tear and followed the course of prolotherapy and stem cell therapy and subsequent PRP and I've had a full recovery using physical therapy as the follow-up and now I have full range of motion of the left arm again. And when she came in, she could barely lift that arm. She, you know, she was in severe pain for about four months, had a pretty large tear, couldn't lift it, and now she's got full range of motion um, and doing very well. And that's typically what we see with these, with, with these patients. So stem cells can also be used for surgery. Uh, they, are, they actually help with rotator cuff repairs. The common tear rate is pretty high, but addition, uh, addition of the stem cells tends to decrease these tears pretty significantly uh, to 9 to 19%. And it also improves the functional outcomes as well. Stem cells have been used for glenohumeral joint arthritis. And this is a very difficult joint to treat when it's just, you know, when the arthritis is pretty significant. Uh, a lot of measures don't seem to work very well. Uh, but in this study, they show that in these 25 patients who received the bone marrow aspirate, they actually did better than the steroids. They compared it to the steroid injections. Uh, steroid injections, as we know, only provide temporary relief, uh, but these bone marrow stem cells tend to work longer, and these patients were followed for 12 months, but very often when you follow them for 24 months, they still seem to do well. And in our clinic, as I mentioned, we typically do other things as well. We do some prolotherapy, uh, we do some uh, physical therapy. So these patients, you can really improve them. And in a lot of these studies, you see that these changes in their pain scores are from like four to two. There might be sometimes seem not like they're very large because again, these studies are looking at just this one intervention. They don't want to mix too many things. But as you know, in clinical medicine, we're always mixing things, right? We're, we're, we're the chefs in the kitchen and you put all these different ingredients and you get the best results. So even though in a study you might get this you know, drop of pain from four or from six to four, well, if you put you know, the same intervention, but you put it in a setting of physical therapy, nutrition, lifestyle modifications, bracing, and all these other things, this pain that must, may have been a six now becomes a one or a zero. Okay, so I think that's pretty important to keep in mind. Stem cells have been used very often for knee arthritis. That is, seems to be one of the most studied joints for stem cells. 
and multiple, multiple meta-analysis and reviews are kind of in agreement that, it, number one, it is safe. It is a pretty safe procedure. There is no, that doesn't seem to have a lot of complications. Typically, 30% of patients have pain, and you know, I would say pretty much all the patients have some pain afterwards. Improves all the clinical outcomes. Uh, may decrease severity of the, the, the disease and, and actually does decrease the progression. So there are some studies looking at either contralateral knees when they injected one versus the other. The one with the injected bone marrow stem cells did not progress as quickly or didn't progress at all while the other knee would or uh, they would compare between other patients. Um, to understand this, we have to understand also their the Kellgren Lawrence grading score. This tells us how bad the arthritis is in an X-ray. We know that necessarily uh, an X-ray severity doesn't equate to a clinical severity, but this is what's used for most studies. Um, so there's different different times when we want to use stem cells, and different times we don't necessarily have to. So in this study, this is by Dr. Ants, actually in North Florida. He used bone marrow stem cells or platelet-rich plasma in patients with mild, mild to moderate, most of the mild arthritis. And he found that actually, after following them for 12 months, the PRP and the stem cell patients did pretty much the same. Uh, they, they both got better. Uh, they both improved their function, but they didn't really seem to do better with stem cells, even though it was a much more invasive procedure. Um, there was a couple issues, I think, with that study. Their cell counts were only into the 100 to 300 thousands. We get cell counts, you know, up to a billion, and I think um, that needs to, I'm sorry, up to a million, and that needs to be taken into account. Uh, but still, when patients have milder arthritis, stem cells may not be necessary. PRP or hyaluronic acid may be very appropriate before having to go to such an invasive procedure. Some of these more moderate knee arthritis patients, as shown in this study, uh, tend to do pretty good. So this is a study of 47 patients with chronic knee pain, pretty moderate, and they failed conservative treatment, and they were told you're a candidate for total knee replacement. So they were offered, do you want to try an alternative? And they said, okay, let's, let's try bone marrow stem cells instead. And it was pretty good. After one year, 97% of these patients did not have a knee replacement, and at two years, 86%, so still pretty good. And as you can see, their improvement was pretty significant. Their functional scores improved significantly as well. And then for really severe arthritis, this is a study done in Athens, Greece. This is, they had 20, 233 patients, only 121 of them came back for follow-up, and they had KL scores three to four. Most of them were four. So these are bone on bone arthritis, these are patients you know, you need knee replacement. Uh, that's what their orthopedic surgeons are telling them. And they had, again, just a single bone marrow stem cell procedure. Um, and they followed them for uh, 12 months. And they got better. You know, if you look on the, on the right, their numeric pain score came down from about 8 to 4.5. Their, their functional scores improved. About 5% of them elected to actually have the knee replacement. So that tells you quite a bit that you know, they're still doing okay. They're not re doing this, this, uh, the, the new replacements. 73% of these patients said they would actually repeat this procedure. That tells us that you know, they must be pretty happy with it. And 86 of them, 86% of these patients said that they would recommend it to other people. So can stem cells restore cartilage? So most of the studies that looked at injection of stem cells into the knee haven't really shown that if you follow them with MRIs or anything else that there is actual cartilage growth. As I mentioned earlier, these stem cells go in there and they create this environment. They, they sense the environment and they secrete all these anti-inflammatory uh, factors. So they create a healthier and a more pleasant environment in the knee. They don't necessarily regenerate that cartilage unless you do something else. And with this study, they looked at arthroscopic implantation of these cells into the knee cartilage. And they took 20 patients and took that adipose stromovascular fraction. And as I mentioned, that's something we cannot do anymore. Uh, but this was a very great source of a lot of stem cells. And then they implanted them, and they looked at them after, after two years. And so here's a picture. On the left, there's an image of the cartilage defect. And on the right, they took these stem cells and they put some fibrin glue and glued them in there. So these are not just hanging out there and, and, and hanging out in the joint. These stem cells actually adhered to the defect and they're glued in there. And they found that the, 
afterwards, they did MRI results, and they found that two years later, a lot of this cartilage has actually repaired, which is pretty interesting. And that's somewhere where we hope to go eventually with our injection therapies too, and I, I think we can get there if we figure out how to glue those stem cells in there, and I don't think we're too far away from that. And interesting in the study, there was a pretty direct correlation between the amount of cartilage regeneration and the outcomes as well. So with patients with knee arthritis, there's a lot of options. There's, you know, you can do the prolotherapy, PRP, you can do stem cells, and sometimes you can do surgically implanted stem cells. Um, the other thing to remember, though, is this has to be part of a comprehensive treatment. So I had a patient the other day who I did a bone marrow stem cells on her about maybe three months ago for pretty significant arthritis, some meniscal tear, and she comes in and she's like, well, I'm not any better. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? I still have pain at night, it's burning at night. And I'm like, well, what about the pain I used to have during walking and ambulation? Oh, that's gone, I'm not having any of that pain. Well, okay, so that's good, that's improved. But this burning pain, so I'm like, okay, let's take a look. And then look at her saphenous nerve, and her saphenous nerve was inflamed. Maybe it was irritated during the procedure. So I did a nerve block, nerve treatment. She comes back two weeks later, oh, now I'm good. Now I'm good. So, you know, these, these procedures, need to be incorporated into an integrative treatment. For this patient, she did very well, it had a low nerve irritation. When we treated that saphenous nerve, the pain resolved and then she was good. So we always have to think about that. It's not just stem cells and, hey, see what happens. Incorporate it with other things. Uh, Dr. Santano, again, he's, he's great what he does. He treats ACL tears. And there's quite a few doctors now doing that, that he treats ACL tears that are grade one, grade two, and even grade three that are complete tears by injecting the stem cells uh, via um, uh, ultrasound, I'm sorry, x-ray guidance. And he gets some pretty good results. He does quite a bit of uh, treatment beforehand. But if you look at these outcome measures on the left, the patients were asked, compared to your condition prior, how much better are you? So at three months, these people are you know, 60, 75, 75 to, you know, 75 to 80 percent better years afterwards. And not only that, but their functional scores, how well is your knee functioning, improves significantly. So that is an option for patients who don't want to have an ACL surgery. In the spine, uh, I think the evidence is still lacking. It's, it's still, I think we need a little bit more research on this. Uh, there is a good article that came out on 26 patients uh, with chronic discogenic pain. They were confirmed that it is disc-related pain. Um, they had some pretty severe discogenic disease, as, as, as identified by this Furman score, which you can see in the middle picture, which shows you the different grades of how degenerated that disc is. And they had patients of you know, level 7 and 6, uh, which is pretty significantly degenerated. And they did an intradisco injection with bone marrow stem cells and followed these patients for three years and then another study for um, five years. And 26 patients started with this study. And at three years, 20 patients continued because six of them actually ended up having surgery, but 20 of them did not. And you look at these, these pain scores and these functional scores, these patients significantly improved. Three months afterwards, six, 12, 24. Three years afterwards, these patients were still significantly improved. And then on the right, the picture shows that even at five years, still improved. At five years, 19 patients were left, so one more had a surgery, but still, that's a pretty good alternative. You know, this is not, stem cell procedures are not the, um, the ultimate thing. It's not the magic pill that's going to cure everything. But it can do a very good job for a lot of people. And it can help many people avoid surgeries. Not guaranteed, but many people can actually avoid surgery and do well for years and years to come. So that's what I always tell my patients. This is, we're not guaranteeing that you're going to be cured with your condition. But there is a good chance, very good chance, that you might not have to need surgery for these conditions. So when we treat the spine, and most clinics nowadays that do regenerative medicine, seems like the stem cells, they're not there yet. We're not using them as much. PRP is very good for spinal conditions. PRP has been studied for facet syndromes, ascite syndromes, uh, ascite joints. You can use PRP in the epidurals, which we do quite often. And that all has been shown clinically and experimentally to do very well for spinal conditions. Stem cells, stem cells are still a little bit limited, so curious to see where that goes. Um, and I am curious to see what happens with the nerves. Um, I don't use nerves, uh, stem cells for nerves yet, 
But I want to show you one of this. This is an interesting case. This is from uh, two weeks ago. And this is very exciting where regenerative medicine can potentially take us. Uh, Bobby, if you can play this for me. This is the can you increase the volume? Hi, this is Lee. Um, a few days ago, Dr. Sebastian gave me hydrodissection for my nerves, which were destroyed by uh, Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre. For the first time in two and a half years, I can feel the bottoms of my feet, and I'm walking without fear, which is pretty exciting to me. And uh, I'm also, I can do my yoga standing poses without holding onto a chair now. So it's been a, a terrific blessing for me. So this is pretty exciting. You know, you can use regenerative medicine to treat nerves. This patient has guillain brain syndrome two and a half years ago, and she couldn't walk very steadily. She couldn't do yoga poses. Um, she couldn't dance. And we did some treatments with some hydrodissection with PRP of her nerves. And you know, pretty quickly, she, she tells us a couple weeks later that she started dancing with her husband. She's walking without fear. Her pain is significantly improved. So I'm looking forward to could we do that maybe in, with stem cells in the future. Currently, it's not what I do. And, I, and most people don't do that. You know, stem cells are pretty painful when you inject them. So we don't inject them up around nerves. I think it would need a lot more processing and cleaning and washing before we can do that. But that's maybe where we can go. And I think, I think that's an exciting, exciting thing that we can uh, look forward to. Uh, and there is a very exciting times for stem cells because there's tons of studies. As you can see on this slide, every year there's studies and studies coming out with very nice results showing how effective these stem cells could be. So one of the things that we need to remember though that it is not the only thing that is going to treat everything that's out there. Stem cells could be part of your team approach. It's very important, like in my clinic and most uh, regenerative clinics, you have to have your whole team. You have to have your therapist, you have to have your nurses, and you got to really do a team approach to give your patients uh, the best results. It's just another tool in our toolbox. You know, we got to make sure that these patients have physical therapy afterwards. Uh, I always have my patients educated on diet and sometimes uh, they're nutritionally deficient so we put them on specific nutrients and vitamins to make sure they have enough, um, enough vitamins to stimulate a healing response, make sure that they have an adequate protein supply. A lot of people are protein deficient. Uh, and then we combine them with other injections if need to. Sometimes we use lasers to stimulate these, these people's healing process. So you really need to look at this as a part of a treatment strategy. Uh, there are some things that need to be done beforehand, like patients need to have a specific diets. They need to sometimes uh, decrease certain medications that can affect their stem cells. Uh, and then post-procedure precautions. It's very important that patients treat their procedure as if they had a little surgery or as if they had something significantly done. They shouldn't be out there and walking and, and back to normal function. They need to really, uh, very often I tell my patients, baby that joint or that shoulder or that tendon and take your time to heal. So, you know, I think it's a very exciting field. I think stem cells um, are going to be explored even farther. We're going to learn a lot more about where to use them and how to use them and how to uh, help our patients even more. Uh, and I'm looking forward to this. And as I showed you before, there's already so many clinical trials. And I bet you when we look at this next year, it's going to be you know, even, even, even more clinical trials. So I think it's a very exciting field. I'm very excited about being able to actually use them in my, in my clinic. And I'm very excited that I was able to share this information with you. And I hope you found this beneficial. And um, I, let me know if you have any other questions or any other insights. Thank you very much. Yeah, typically you don't repeat it more than once a year, correct? Uh, because as you saw, a lot of those studies show that the healing takes time. At three months, they were 
maybe even halfway through their healing process. Six months, you look at them and they heal longer and longer. So you do, it's not something you do frequently. Um, if you need to, if you feel like you need to repeat it, you would probably wait at least a year. And that's what we would do. Uh, very often we don't find that we have to repeat it. We, off, we do often add like a touch up of platelet rich plasma, let's say like three or six months later. And that's to, that's to stimulate them even more. Uh, with knees, sometimes you can put some hyaluronic acid afterwards, and that seems to help too. Uh, but that's that's the case. Thank you. That's a good question. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so, on the first video you showed us where you were uh, drawing the stem cells and the bone marrow. Correct. Uh, what happens if you're trying to do that and you don't have enough blood Everything is done on the same. So the question is, do we reinfuse on the same day? Yes. And as you saw in the FDA regulations, we have to do it all on the same day, minimal manipulation. So as soon as I withdraw it, we took it to our lab, we concentrate it, and then we put it back in. So the patients usually come in, it's about a two-hour two -hour visit to our, to our clinic. First is the harvesting, and then the second is the injection. So the older you get, the question is about age, the older you get, <clears throat> the less stem cells you have in your bone marrow and the less active. But as you saw in that study with the severe knee arthritis patients, they still get better. Even these older patients with less active and less uh, numerous stem cells, they still get better. So we typically don't limit it. It's also, can the patient tolerate the procedure? If there is a patient who's 90 years old and frail and can't tolerate the procedure and the post-procedure precautions, uh, then, then they're not good candidates. You do have to be pretty selective about the patients. They have to be able to heal, they have to be healthy, and they have to be able to follow the post-procedure protocols. Thank you very much.